Jesse James, John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, are just some who choose, chose robbery as a way to make a lot of money in a short amount of time. If someone said to you, let's go rob this bank, not only would you say no, but you would probably say, help me understand. <laughs> Watch out now. Help me understand why you would even think of something like that. I see y'all telling me where your minds are at. <laughs> I, I ain't right for that. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. You'd probably think somebody was crazy for asking you something like that. It's just not something that we would do. Bank robbery, though, is very common in this country. According to the FBI, there are probably 5,000 bank robberies every year. Even Santa Claus gets into the act because around Christmas time, it seems that people like to dress up as Santa Claus and go out and rob a bank. Someone asked a bank robber one time, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money's at. But you got to have a lot of audacity to rob, whether it be a bank or anything else. It takes a lot of audacity to be a robber. Now, there's a difference between audacity and bravery. The difference being audacity has two companions that bravery doesn't. Audacity has along with it stupidity and recklessness. The mindset of a robber is this. I know that what you have belongs to you, but I'm going to take it from you anyway. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to take it by force. That's the mindset of a robber. I interviewed a bank robber here in Fort Worth not long ago, and he robbed the bank without a gun, without a knife or anything. Strong arm robbery. He was a big fella. And he just grabbed hold of the teller and shook him. Said, give me all the money. And the teller, in fear, gave up the money. The last felony case that I worked was a robbery gone bad. And the robbery went bad because although the robber had a gun, he didn't realize <laughs> that the homeowner was waiting with a shotgun. And the homeowner ended the robber's career that day. The prophet Malachi, in his book, talks about robbery. The robber that he talks about is man who was created in God's image. The robbery victim is God. Robbery is defined as taking something by force. That's just one definition of robbery, and certainly none of us would do that to God. But robbery is also defined as depriving someone of something they expect, something they desire, or something that is rightfully theirs. For example, someone can be deprived of money, Food, clothing, affection such as love, honor, thanksgiving. Abused persons are often said to be robbed of love. Someone in a workplace sometimes who does not receive a promotion is said to be robbed of a Promotion. So there are different kinds of robbery, one based on violence and one based on emotion. Now it would be easier, certainly, to rob God based on emotion. And it would be robbing God of the praise, honor, glory, love, and thanksgiving that he expects, that he deserves, and that is rightfully his. Open your Old Testaments, please, to the book of Malachi.
Malachi chapter 1. With the change of technology, I'm, I'll have to change from opening your Old Testament to click on your phone to Malachi and so forth. It, it, it's amazing how technology is just changing things. Remember, even before the Bibles, it was take out your stone tablet to the book of Malachi. So technology is good in this respect. Malachi chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. A son honors his father, and a slave honors his master. If I am a father, where is the honor that's due me? If I am a master, where is the respect that's due to me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priests, who show contempt, and that means disrespect for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt? How have we disrespected your name. And the Lord responds by offering defiled food on my altar. Remember the Old Testament system of worship was one in which they would offer an animal sacrifice and that would be burned up before God. God says you are offering defiled food on my altar. That sacrifice that went on that altar, God said it had to be an animal from your flock, but it had to be what? A perfect animal. God said, don't bring me that animal you knew was fixing to die anyway. Don't bring the sick, the crippled, the lame, none of that, because mankind tends to be trifling. Why it would be necessary for God to say that is really unfortunate. And what it represents is the poor characteristic in mankind that man would take the least of what he has and try to offer that up to God. God said, don't do that. When you go out to the flock to pick an animal to offer up as a sacrifice, it has to be one of your best. It can have no blemishes. So that was the Old Testament system of worship. God said, you, O priests, talking to the religious leaders now, he said, you have offered defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you by saying the Lord's table is contemptible? Mean, meaning it's unimportant. It means nothing to me. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? And those are rhetorical questions. It means you don't have to answer. The answer is, of course he wouldn't be pleased. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands? And so God's people were offering up to God less than their best. But I know we wouldn't do that today. God's people wouldn't be guilty of that today. Surely not. Verse 14, cursed is the cheat. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it to the Lord, but then sacrifices blemished animal to the Lord. Have you ever had it in mind and heart to do the Lord good and then change your mind? and give the Lord less than you intended. Amen. He said, for I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. How did they rob God? They robbed God by not giving him the praise, the glory, the honor, the love, the thanksgiving that he desired, that he expected, and that was rightfully his, that he rightfully deserved. And so the question is, what about us? Does God receive from us what he expects, what he desires, what is rightfully his? Does God receive from us what he deserves? If not, then we are robbing God. 
We are guilty of having the audacity to say to God, I know the praise belongs to you. I know the honor belongs to you. God, I know the thanksgiving, the love. I know all that belongs to you, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to keep it for myself. Well, someone says, preacher, I would never do that to God. I would never treat God that way. What kind of person do you think I am anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Why don't we let God answer that question? Because the Israelites asked the very same question. They said, God, we would never treat you that way. And they had the audacity to ask God, when did we disrespect you? When did we dishonor you? When did we not give you what you deserve? They said, we would never do that. God said, yeah, you would. When did we do it, God? God said, let me break it down for you. God said, when you have the ability to do something for me and you did not do it, that's robbery. When you have the ability to give me something and you gave me nothing, that's robbery. When you have the ability to represent me to the world, but you fail to do so, that's robbery. When you had the ability to give me more, but instead you gave me less. That's robbery. When you had the ability to work hard for the growth of my kingdom, but instead you chose to be lazy, that's robbery. No different than Jesus, what Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 25. Remember the parable of the, of the laborers in the vineyard? And the owner said, you wicked, lazy servant. No different than those who rob God of that which is due him. Our relationship with God is not a 50-50 relationship. Our relationship with God is not a 60-40, 70-30 relationship. God wants from us. God must have from us 100%. God will settle for nothing less. And here's the thing. Remember Jesus at the cross? Jesus did not give 50% at the cross. He didn't give 60% at the cross. Jesus did not give 70% at the cross. Songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. Jesus gave 100% at the cross. Jesus gave us his very best. God gave us his very best at the cross, and he expects the same thing in return. Anything less than that is robbery from the Lord God Most High. Jesus said, anyone who wants to be my disciple must do what? Deny this person. Deny themselves. That's first. Deny themselves in order to be my disciple. That means we are not First in line, we are not second or third in line. We're not even at the end of the line. We are not in line at all. That's what self-denial is all about. That's what offering our bodies as living sacrifices is all about. When that sacrifice is on the altar, it was killed first. It's dead. When we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, we are offering ourselves completely. That's a sacrifice, that's a dead sacrifice. That's what sacrificial living is all about. Yes, I want to go to Neiman Marcus and get stuff for me. Yes, I want to go to the jewelry store and get stuff for me. Yes, I want to go to the Mercedes dealership and get something for me. Yes, I want to call a real estate agent and get something for me. But before I do any of that, I've got to make sure that God gets his first, 100 percent first. You see, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about God and what he wants. The apostle says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he died for all, Jesus died for all, that those who live should no longer live 
for themselves, but for him who died and is raised again. I love it when Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It ain't about me no more. Once I've been offered up as a living sacrifice, it's got to be all about God, 100% about God. And you know what? He doesn't care whether I'm dressed in a tuxedo or a toe-up t-shirt. Because God doesn't care about what's on the outside. What God is concerned with is what's on the inside. Window dressing does not impress God. God is concerned about what's going on inside this house, not what's going on outside. Jesus said to the Pharisees, y'all ain't nothing but whitewashed tombs. Oh, you look good on the outside, but inside you are rotten, stink, and dead. Go out to the graveyard right now. What will you find? Beautiful marble stones. But what are they hiding? They are hiding stink, decay, and death. Songwriter put it this way. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul. Lord, I give it to you. Take control. I give my body as a living sacrifice. Lord, please take control. For when my life is controlled by me, then God does not get the glory, the honor, the praise that's rightfully his. I wind up robbing God of that which is his. When I control what happens in this body, then God does not get his. That's why instead of robbing God, I've got to sing with the songwriter who said, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. The Israelites were giving God what was at the bottom of their priority list. What about us? What priority does giving to God hold in our hearts and lives? This is the priority that we hold in God's heart. This is the priority that we hold in God's mind. For God so loved you and you and me. He didn't stop there that he gave and he gave his only son. For even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. There's a song in our books. It's number 159. Are we able to get that on the screen? The individual who wrote this song knew the heart of Jesus. He said, I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quickened from the dead. Death held us captive and would not let go. Death held us for ransom and would not let us go. I could not pay your ransom. You could not pay my ransom, but praise God for Lord Jesus because Jesus paid that ransom. Jesus paid it all. And he says, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Verse 2. My father's house of light, my glory circled throne. This is Jesus talking. I left for earthly night, for wanderings sad and lone. Jesus said, I left the palace 
for the outhouse. I went from riches to rags. I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left anything? That's what ought means. That's one of them old British words. I think it's British, one of them old fashioned words. Have you left anything for me? Verse three, I suffered much for thee, more than my tongue can tell, a bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. Jesus said, I suffered much for thee. Remember the beatings that Jesus endured? Imagine somebody taking your shirt off and exposing your back. And then they just start whipping you. Until it tears your flesh. And it just rips your back up, makes it look like hamburger meat. That's what Jesus is talking about when he said, I suffered much for thee. Remember the crown of thorns? We've got a rose bush in the yard, and Carolyn said to me, say, hey, that rose bush needs to be trimmed. Now, there's a reason that rose bush wasn't trimmed, because I don't like trimming it. I don't think there's a time I mess with that rose bush that I don't get stuck. Got to put on heavy gloves, even walking by it. Those thorns, are just, it just seems like they reach out and grab you. They made a crown out of those thorns, and they pressed it into Jesus' head. That's what he's talking about when he said, I suffered much for thee. Remember this one here? That's when they were driving nails through his hands, pinning him to the cross. This Jesus who had no sin, was doing it for you, Brother Klein. Was doing it for you, Michael. Aubrey, Greg, he was doing it for you. And he was showing up doing it for me. I suffered much for thee, more than my tongue can tell. The agony was bitter, and it was to rescue you from hell. Then he says, I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? Are we robbing God or are we giving God back what he deserves? Next verse, and I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free my pardon and my love. If you were on death row, I've never experienced it. I've never been there. But I can only imagine a prisoner on death row whose attorney said, we may get a call from the governor. And all he's looking for is one word. P-A-R-D-O-N. Did I spell that right? Greg, school teacher, did I spell that right? He's looking to be pardoned. That's all he wants to hear. Jesus said, that's what I brought down from heaven. Salvation, full and free. My pardon and my love. Remember I said Jesus was the only one that was sinless? That means you were guilty and you needed pardon. You were guilty. You, 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 you. How many times I got to do this? All of us were guilty. All of us needed pardon. And at 11.59, when no one else could save us, 11.59, the phone rang. And on the other end, it was Jesus. And he said, don't kill him. I died to buy their pardon. He said, I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought for me? Are we robbing God by not giving back to him what he expects, what he desires, and what he so richly deserves? Compare what Jesus did with the rich young ruler. He went to Jesus and said, 
good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? Jesus said, keep all the commandments. He said, I've been doing that since I was a little boy. Got that covered. Jesus said, but you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Quit thinking about yourself and think about other folk. Jesus said, sell everything you have and give to the poor. Bible said dude walked away. He wasn't trying to hear that. He didn't like that verse of the song Jesus was singing. He wanted the kingdom of heaven, but he wasn't willing to do what it took to gain the kingdom of heaven. What about you? Are you willing to do what it takes to inherit the kingdom of God? You know, we can impress one another, we can impress others by outward appearances. Our prayers, carrying a Bible around, but God does not look at that. God looks beyond that. He looks at the heart. Are we robbing God by holding back what he deserves? Or are we giving God what he deserves, what he desires, and what he rightly deserves? what's rightfully his. I can't say whether or not you are robbing God. I can only speak for this dude. But you know whether or not you are robbing God. And if you are, you need to repent. If this morning your walk is not with God, and it's your desire to make a change, to hold on to God's unchanging hand, we encourage you to make that change now, while we stand and sing.